through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. This is Spencer with the MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Alex Gibney, uh, director of We Steal Secrets, the story of WikiLeaks. You might know him from any number of other things. For instance, uh, Taxi to the Dark Side, which you won an Academy Award for. Uh, some of my favorites, Client Nine, The Rise and Fall of Elliot Spitzer, Casino Jack in the United States of Money, Enron, the smartest guys in the room. Like You are a prolific documentary filmmaker. Let's start off with that. Just how, how do you balance all these? Do you have like five projects simultaneously going on at any given time? Because you've done more documentaries in the last decade than probably like most documentary filmmakers do in their life. Well, I mean, I don't have that many projects going at once, but often there'll be more than one. And sometimes the reason is that <laughs> things don't, uh, the story doesn't unfold the way you want it to or as quickly as you want it to sure. and sometimes you have to stop you have to take time out we tried to get Jack Abramoff to speak in, in um, Casino Jack and it seemed like he was going to I was visiting him in prison but we thought okay we've got a film now but we're going to stop put the film on hold to see if we can get him to talk and ultimately the Department of Justice you know, <laughs> didn't uh, let uh, us talk to him but but that's one of the reasons why sometimes a film takes longer. And if you're only working on one, then as a practical matter, if you decide to stop, then, well, now what are you going to do? You, you also work in a very sort of interesting area of film in that a lot of the stuff, perhaps maybe not like the, the Hunter S. Thompson documentary, but a lot of them deal with, I guess you would call them sensitive subjects. You know, Enron <laughs> was a, a massive catastrophe in mm -hmm. the economy. Um, this one deals with the U.S. government, and they're not so uh, open and uh, forthright a lot of the time, hence the whole purpose of WikiLeaks. Uh, I mean, it's, it seems like you navigate some very tumultuous waters. How challenging is that as a filmmaker to get the information you want and tell the story as you think it should be told. Because I feel like, you know, a lot of times, like, the government will be like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll let you do that, but we want to see what the film's going to look like before you're done, before we sign off on it or something like that. Well, you that. can't ever agree to that. That's, that's rule number one, and that's why ultimately, and we still secrets, that Julian Assange didn't give me an interview. Because I said, <laughs> I, I told him, I said, I'm not working for you. And I said, I'm, I'm going to do this film whether you cooperate with me or not. I, I hope you will because I'm sympathetic to what you're doing, but, I, but I'm doing it, I'm, I'm not asking for your permission to do it. And likewise, you know, in Klein and I, I didn't ask, I didn't ask Spitzer's permission first before I decided to do the movie. I said, I'm doing the movie, we're going to do it with you or without you, would you appear? So I think that's absolutely vital. You have to let people know that you're doing it anyway, and sometimes it's in their best interest to talk. I generally find that when people talk, you can't help when you sit down with them for a while to see their essential humanity to become, generally speaking, more sympathetic. Oh, I, I mean, your documentary alone made me fascinated by Elliot Spitzer. Like, if the dude ran for president now, given all the baggage mm -hmm. he still has, I would vote for him because right. he is such a fascinating and forthcoming guy. I mean, let's be honest. For this, though, what was sort of the impetus? Do you, do you just flip through the newspaper every day and look for interesting stories? And is that how you sort of come up with ideas for these documentaries? Or what exactly was it about WikiLeaks that you were like, I feel like there's a story to be told there? I mean, look, it seems like I just like, wave my magic wand and decide <laughs> which project I want to do and then go do it. It doesn't work that way. I mean, this was one that came to me. Mark Schmugger, who was the former co-chairman of Universal, Hmm. came to me uh, right after the State Department logs, uh, State Department cables had been published by WikiLeaks and the other papers, and said, would you like to do this story? And I said, absolutely. And he was able to get Universal to put up the money, and, and we did it. It didn't come at a very good time in the sense that I was busy working mm. on something else, but this was a story I, you know, I couldn't resist. It was so important and so interesting and so much about who we are now. I mean, it's a very interesting story. Like, I mean, obviously the title is like, We Steal Secrets, the story of WikiLeaks, but as much of a story 
of WikiLeaks, I mean, it's a story of Julian Assange and it's a story of Bradley Manning. Like those two players play such an incredibly important role that their story, I mean, I guess you could say simultaneously travels for one up and down based upon the course of WikiLeaks. Like Julian Assange gains a huge amount of notoriety and fame because of WikiLeaks and then ultimately kind of comes crashing down on him as he gets an inflated ego or whatever you want to categorize as. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Bradley Manning, I mean, he sort of puts this all in motion and it ultimately comes crashing down on him. How did you sort of, you know, sort of figure out that balance between telling, you know, just a WikiLeaks story versus just a Julian Assange story or even just a Bradley Main story? Because each of them feels like it could have been a documentary in and of itself because each of them are such interesting characters in their own right. <laughs> And they could have been. And, and, and frankly, I started out probably making more of the Julian Assange story. But what it turns out to be is that this story is actually more about relationships than you would think. It's not just about the great and wonderful Julian Assange or no. Bradley Manning. It's about the relationship between Julian Assange and Bradley Manning. It's about the relationship between Bradley Manning and Adrian Lamo. It's about the relationship between... Julian Assange and uh, the journalistic organizations or the women in Sweden. It's about these interpersonal relationships. We're talking about leaks, the, the relationship between a, a source and a publisher or a journalist. Those are also relationships. And at the end of the day, that was the biggest change for me as I started out this film thinking that it was about a machine, mm. a leaking machine, this anonymous electronic drop box that WikiLeaks had pioneered. Uh, so that people could leak anonymously. Well, it turns out that it's much more complicated than that. First of all, that doesn't guarantee pure anonymity, as we now know, um, either because of the machinery itself, because you can actually detect at either end of the exchange, or because people sometimes need to take credit for what it is that they do. And that was the case with Bradley Manning. And I think there's an element, you know, as someone who is vaguely familiar with these characters as a play out, like I remember WikiLeaks releasing the sort of the hubbub over that. I remember Julian Assange being trapped in the embassy. Uh, I remember elements of that, but I didn't really see the whole picture. And it's amazing how, I guess in some ways, this feels like one of the most human stories I've ever heard because... There's no real heroes. There's no real villains like you empathize with wanting to get this information out there, but you also empathize with not wanting to put people in danger. You know, right. you empathize with Julian Assange's quest, but at the same time, he, I mean, as the saying goes, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, it clearly seems to corrupt him as it goes along, you know. I mean, it, it seems like there's no heroes and no villains, and this is just such a, a muddled kind of crazy story it seems like it'd be it's probably tough as a journalist or maybe maybe since it is so muddled how how do you sort of balance that element of like what you believe the story is or like who you believe is right and sort of keeping it neutral because it seems like there could have been any number of ways if you wanted to sort of set in an agenda, you could easily push that in this film. This feels very even-handed. Well, you used the phrase muddled, but I actually see the story more in terms of balance. It's the balance of sort of uh, good and bad, or yeah. the balance of transparency and secrecy. These things fall out of balance, and then they have to come back into balance. And, and characters like that, too. None of us are all good or all bad. It's that balance, and that delicate balance. And so over time, you know, um, I felt it was very important that, that the movie show the way in which these characters change. Yeah. You actually, at the beginning of the film, you perceive this disembodied um, text voice uh, that later we know to be Bradley Manning to be somehow malevolent, like it's possibly dangerous, some, yeah. some hacker invading uh, the space. That's how we present him. Over time, you realize he's a much more vulnerable, naive, Confused, idealistic yeah. character. Um, Julian Assange, 
comes off very much as kind of an idealistic crusader at the beginning. And then you see that he himself becomes corrupted. He, he has a device for holding governments and corporations to account, but he doesn't want to be held to account. Uh, he's all about transparency, but then he starts to make his followers sign non-disclosure agreements. Yeah, that was amazing. And then when, then when I'm trying to interview him, he, he says that the market rate for an interview is either a million dollars, and I say, I won't do that. He said, well, if you won't do that, how about if you spy on the other interview subjects? Yeah, that, so now that was pretty profound. the transparency character is asking me to behave like a CIA agent and give him intel. So, you know, characters are complicated. It's, it's funny to think that whole like million dollar thing because it seems like he seems simultaneously broke because I mean I guess he's spending so much on legal and all that stuff but it's like if he were really making that much money you would think he would have a massive fortune and yet this guy seems to lead a very pedestrian life towards the end once it, everything starts crashing down on him. I don't think money has ever been a motivator for Julian Assange, but it's also fair to say that a lot of money has passed through his hands or through the WikiLeaks organization. Uh, even his book advance, which ultimately became the subject for yet another legal dispute, no. um, you know, ultimately was a, was a pretty big number. So uh, he, yet he doesn't do things... In some ways, he was quite reckless. He paid a fortune in legal fees in order to defend himself from extradition to Sweden, which, frankly, he could have gotten out of the way rather yeah, easily. That, that, was, that was one of the most remarkable parts of the story, honestly. The whole rape trial mm -hmm. versus just like needing to do an HIV test. Like, right. Had he gone and done an HIV test, none of this would have happened. But On such things, history is made. I mean, I guess it speaks, though, to that notion of like, you know, uh, did was it his ego that got him that far though but also brought him down because you know it, I mean, well yes I think that's a good point because the fact is a lot of us wouldn't have heard of WikiLeaks if they hadn't had this fantastically charismatic figure at its center um, its inventor really and because he was that charismatic and because he had brass balls he 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 gets a lot of attention but he becomes so fond of that attention and so fond of kind of sculpting the story in a way that he would like it to be rather than the way it is, ultimately that corrupts the very organization because then he drags it down into the midst of, this, um, of these sex allegations in Sweden. They don't, so far as I was able to ascertain, they have absolutely nothing to do with WikiLeaks. It's just a guy behaving badly. We'll see whether or not it was criminal if he ever goes back to face trial in Sweden. But the fact is that it had nothing to do with the transparency agenda. It had to do with a guy who was a kind of internet rock star going to Sweden and, you know, being uh, pursued by a lot of beautiful women. Yeah, that was sort of one of the interesting things is when all the allegations start coming out and he's dealing with these legal situations, you know, they're trying to keep WikiLeaks going. And essentially, doesn't he tell someone, you know, uh, like he is WikiLeaks, like they can't ha they can't sort of sever from him and go and just... Well, you know, a lot of people in... So a lot of people who are working with WikiLeaks said, look, Julian, while this is happening, while you're dealing with this matter in Sweden, just make it a personal matter. Say that's what it is, take some time off, go deal with it, and then, you know, come back. Or just make it clear to everybody that this is a personal matter, it's got nothing to do with the WikiLeaks. In fact, as one person reported, he did just the opposite. That is, he announced in a WikiLeaks meeting that they were now going to make the Sweden issue part of the transparency agenda by, by way of claiming that it was a dirty trick by somebody. And he never says so in so many words. He says in the film, I never said that it was a honey trap. I never said that it was not a honey trap. That's a way of saying, like, read between the lines. It was yeah. probably a honey trap. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's one of those, like, sort of plausible deniability things where you're like, I didn't I say it. I never but, said it was a honey exactly, trap. Exactly, yeah. Uh, it, one, I mean, I don't know. I'd be curious to get your impression. Like, for me... It almost feels like, and I don't know if it's true, that there was some sort of mental breakdown in Julian Assange. That I'm not saying that the governments aren't out to get him. Maybe they are. But he seems to get so paranoid 
by the end of the movie that like it, it seems like there is something psychologically going on with him. I mean, like when he's he's asking you to spy for him or he's making everyone sign NDAs, which is completely against the concept of WikiLeaks. I mean, it seems like he's just absolutely fixated on this uh, that the governments are conspiring to get him. And maybe, you know... Well, look, I mean, as Hunter Thompson once said, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean I don't have enemies. True. <laughs> but I think the clue to this is given to us by Mark Davis, the Australian filmmaker who mm. followed Julian mm. around just before and during the Afghan war log release. Uh, and we used a lot of his footage in the film. You know, he says that a lot of his behavior when he was seemingly being pursued by authorities, you know, switching cell phones constantly, diving in and out of right, safe yeah, yeah. houses, so forth and so on, that was warranted. But he had been doing that same kind of behavior for years and years and years before that, before anybody even knew or cared who he was. And so that gives you some sense that he lives intensely in his imagination. And so when it does appear that he is being persecuted, and indeed we show in the film, I mean, powerful American politicians are calling for his arrest. Talk show hosts are calling for him to be taken out with a drone. Um, Visa and MasterCard stop payments to WikiLeaks. You can see how he might feel victimized. Yeah. But I think what happens is that then mixes with Julian's own sort of inventive personality, yeah. where he always imagines there's a conspiracy around every corner. Yeah, that was one of the interesting things, actually. I like the naivete of Julian Assange in that, like, he felt like, you know, there was nothing that um, governments or politicians could do that would really get to him. And then when the particularly, it seemed like, mostly right-wing spin got in. It was like, you know, talking about how he was putting everyone in danger. Yeah, there's like, blood on his hands. Yeah, blood on their hands. Like, that, like, the way that spin, it just, it almost seemed to, like, completely catch him off guard that, like, it was even possible. Like, it seemed like there was a naivete that he didn't Well, there realize. was a naivete. And, and, and frankly, if he had been a better listener, the journalists were trying to educate him about what might happen. Because the journalists had been down that road before. They've had big stories published in ways where governments come after them. And you have to be prepared. That's why you have to be extra careful. Uh, whether or not um, you know, anybody was, was harmed as a result of, right. of materials being left in the logs, and so far as we know, nobody was, the idea that, he, that, that WikiLeaks would not redact the Afghan war logs allowed him to be marginalized by these other characters. And so I think, you know, the, the whole strategy of aligning himself with The Guardian, The New York Times, and Der Spiegel was to give himself some political cover. And that's why they wanted The New York Times in the mix, too, because The New York Times is in this country where the Pentagon is. Um, but in that process, look, he's, he's, he's young. He had never done anything like this before. This was a huge leak, the world's biggest leak in the world. It's understandable that he would make some mistakes. Julian's problem is he can never admit that he makes mistakes. Yeah. He is all powerful, all perfect. He is the one. And 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 you you know, it was really interesting when we talked to the guy who prosecuted him back when he was part of this the uh, hacker, hacker group, the International Subversives. He said the same thing that Julian could never accept ever that he was wrong, that he was the all-powerful one, and that if anybody ever attacked him, it wasn't that he was ever wrong, it was that he was unjustly accused, that he was a martyr. So in that sense, I think you have the seeds for Julian's ultimate corruption. What do you sort of feel after going through all this is sort of the legacy of WikiLeaks? Because, I mean, you know, it does get sort of... Um, their sort of role in all this sort of gets... Um, sort of m mixed up as it goes along and becomes more of Julian Assange's agenda. Mm. But, you know, like, you show that scene where um, they're shooting or bombing the uh, the van or those individuals, right. those journalists. The, the, with vid the, the video of the Apache helicopter right. attack. And that, I mean, 
is quite shocking and disturbing to like listen to what they're saying, seeing what they're doing, and I think that's and important. to understand that children were shot as well as um, two Reuters journalists. Yeah. And it, it, it's just like that stuff. I do feel like there is a place for letting the public know, but at the same time, that kind of stuff gets lost and all this Julian Assange craziness. Do you do you think? Well, I think it shouldn't get lost. I mean, I think you're absolutely right to make the point. You know. Just because Julian Assange made some mistakes, just because he's possessed of some rather strange personality flaws, it doesn't mean that the transparency agenda is in and of itself misguided. We can't confuse the person with a mission. Um, and, and the fact is that the United States government radically overclassifies in a way that is damaging not only to our own civil liberties and our need and our right to know what's being done in our names, but also to our own national security. Because if people can't scrutinize mistakes, just as, you know, if Julian Assange doesn't allow his mistakes to be scrutinized, so on the other side, if the U.S. government doesn't allow its mistakes to be scrutinized, they'll be repeated. So it's vital that we have access to this information. And so leaking or publishing that video was a tremendously valuable service. And that's something that WikiLeaks did. And they were the first ones to do it, and they should still be celebrated for it. So yeah. I, think, I think the ongoing legacy of WikiLeaks is not to look at Julian Assange. It's to look at how can we get it right the next time? How can other organizations, or maybe WikiLeaks can be reformed? But the point is, it's not the only one. Julian's not the only person who can do this. There's now an electronic Dropbox at The New Yorker, for example, that mm. was just established, and it was designed by uh, Aaron Schwartz, the guy who did it for WikiLeaks was that? No, 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 no. Aaron Schwartz is the um, the internet activist who recently committed suicide when the federal oh, government. Oh yeah, from Reddit. Went, went, that's correct. When the federal uh, government yes. went after him in a very heavy-handed way. Um, so okay, we're getting towards the end of this. Um, the film is We Steal Secrets: The Story of WikiLeaks. Uh, is there a website for us that people can find out when it's going to be playing? Oh, geez, I should, I should know the website. but uh, I'll look it up and put it down here, worst case scenario. Right. And uh, what about you? Do you have a Twitter or website or anything that people can find out what you've got going on since you've clearly... Sure, there's, uh, I have a website. It's uh, jigsawprods.com, and I have a Twitter handle, which is it's a little complicated. You can look it up under Alex Gibney, but it's at... Balu Bolivar. It's a Thelonious Monk song. Hmm. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what the reaction is as this film gets out there, and I'm glad uh, they brought you to Sif for it. Thanks, it's great. man. Uh, check out more interviews at MacGuffinPodcast.com. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Like, don't even try to bite the sun. Mm -hmm. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.